Did you know that 1.5 million people in the United States suffer from a compression fracture every year? That's nearly one person every 20 seconds. And most of them don't even realize that it's happened until the damage is already done. Today, we're talking about what to do right away after having a compression fracture to protect your spine, to reduce pain, and to prevent it from happening again. The three steps that we discussed today could be the turning point for your healing and your long-term bone health. Hello, my friends. I'm Sarah, and I'm a nutritional health coach through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, and also I'm a 500-hour trained yoga teacher with additional training that's specific to osteoporosis and yoga. I'm also a BoneFit certified fitness instructor. The 1.5 million compression fractures that happen each year are not okay with me, and I hope that they're not okay with you either. This has led me to be on a mission to reduce the number of osteoporotic fractures that happen each year. Statistics show that after someone has their first compression fracture, the average refracture rate is about five months later, but it doesn't have to be this way. And together we can improve the statistics, we can reduce the number of fractures, and we can improve our bone health long-term while experiencing a better quality of life. Here's the hard truth. Many people don't even realize that they've had a compression fracture. They might feel a sudden pain in their back and they assume that it's just a pulled muscle or part of getting older. So they push through it, not knowing that their spine has actually been injured. But ignoring it or guessing at the cause can actually delay healing and it can also lead to further damage. That's why the very first step is so important and it's one that too many people skip. The first thing that you must do after having a compression fracture is to get an accurate diagnosis and a clear medical plan. This is the foundation for everything else and it's how you take control of your recovery instead of letting the injury take control of you. So if you've had a sudden back pain and you know that you have low bone density, it's important to find out exactly what's going on. The only way to know for sure if you've had a compression fracture is through imaging. Compression fractures vary widely in how serious they are and in how much pain that they cause. Getting proper imaging will give you the best picture of what you're dealing with. And that information is important for forming an immediate medical plan and then also a longer term plan after that. Get the right information first. Your doctor might order an x-ray to check for fractures. In some cases, they may need an MRI or a CT scan to look more closely if they suspect that the fracture is new or if there's concern about nerve involvement. A compression fracture can sometimes cause a piece of the vertebrae to collapse backwards into the spinal canal or the small openings where the nerves exit the spine. That pressure on the nerve can cause pain, numbness, or even muscle weakness. This is similar to the effects of spinal stenosis, but it's technically different. Spinal stenosis means that there's a narrowing of the space within your spine. It gets littler and littler, and it's usually caused by wear and tear over time, stemming from arthritis or disc degeneration. But keep in mind that a compression fracture can actually create a similar narrowing or make existing stenosis worse. So if you suddenly develop a nerve pain after a fracture, the issue might not be a classic stenosis, but rather a new or worsened compression on the nerve that's caused by the fracture itself. This is why it's so important to get the right imaging. Usually an MRI if you feel like there's the possibility of having nerve damage so that your doctor can see exactly what's going on. If nerve involvement is present, there are targeted treatments that can relieve pressure and prevent long-term damage of the nerves. Let's take a moment to talk about pain. Whether it's a deep ache in your back, a sharp radiating pain that shoots into your hips or your legs, the pain after a compression fracture is real and it can feel overwhelming. But there are safe and effective ways to manage it while supporting your healing. Your doctor may suggest taking a medication that will calm overactive nerve signals. 
In more severe cases, your doctor might even suggest having a nerve block or refer you to a specialist to help to relieve the pressure on your nerves. Even if nerves aren't involved, the fracture itself can cause inflammation and that can make your back feel stiff, sore, and swollen. During the time right after fracture, it's important to listen to your body and not overdo it. A couple of times a day, it's helpful to sit with an ice pack over your compression fracture to reduce the inflammation for about 15 minutes at a time. You hear so much about the importance of exercising to improve bone health. And after a fracture, it's tempting to want to get right in and to do as much as you can, especially if like me, you're inclined to be right up and moving after having surgery. I vividly remember coming home from the hospital after my fourth baby was born. I'd had my third C-section and I had three little boys at home. I tried to take a nap the day after I came home with my new baby and when I got up, my boys had somehow climbed the pantry shelves. They tipped over a whole container of sugar in the pantry. Let's just say that I didn't try to take any more naps with my baby and I was up and pretty busy post-surgery. So if you have a tendency to behave this way like me, let me counsel you, please behave better than I did. Give yourself time to heal. This doesn't mean that you have to stop doing all of the things that you normally do, but it does mean that you need to rest periodically and take it a bit easier than you normally do. It can be really hard to slow down, I get it, but our bodies need time to heal and you have to give your body that time. Exercise is incredibly important for preventing future fractures and we'll get to talking about that in a few minutes but initially give your body a little rest and get the medical okay before you begin exercising after having had a fracture. When we hear the word fracture, most people think of a fall or some major accident, but what's surprising is that many compression fractures actually happen during our normal everyday movements if you have low bone density. It might happen when you're simply reaching down to tie your shoes, or lifting a grocery bag out of your trunk, or even sneezing or coughing hard. And then suddenly there's a sharp, unexpected pain in your back. That's how fragile vertebrae can collapse under pressure. The most common sites are in the mid to lower back, and these types of fractures are sometimes called postural fractures because they don't always result from having a trauma like an accident. They can happen from simply having poor alignment or posture that's poor during ordinary daily movements. The way that we move and hold ourselves, especially after a fracture, can be the difference between ongoing pain and a successful recovery. This brings us to the second thing that you must do after having a compression fracture, and that's move safely. Unsafe movement patterns, especially forward rounding of the spine, can interfere with healing. They can increase pain and they can potentially worsen a compression fracture. You need to avoid coming into a rounded shape as much as possible. And after having a compression fracture, that kind of forward bending can actually deepen a compression. It can make healing more painful and it can lead to another fracture. The truth is that most of us round our spines dozens of times throughout the day, whether we're bending to pick something up, slouching on the couch, reading in bed, scrolling on our phones. It's just a natural movement. But when you have low bone density, it's one that can quickly become dangerous. So if you've had a compression fracture, this is the movement that you need to start doing differently, more mindfully, more aligned, and more safely. And don't worry, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. First, you want to maintain a neutral spine, which means keeping the natural curves of your spine in place without coming into any kind of excessive rounding or arching. Whether you're sitting, standing, or bending, Think about lengthening through the crown of your head upward and keeping your chest lifted slightly. Avoid collapsing forward, especially through your upper back. Good posture isn't about being stiff, rather it's about being supported and aligned so that your bones and muscles can work together without added strain. Let's go over some techniques that you can use to adapt your movement in safe ways. 
The hip hinge is one of the most important techniques that you can learn for protecting your spine when you're bending. Instead of rounding your spine to reach forward, keep your back flat and bend from your hip joints. Imagine pushing your hips back behind you as your upper back lowers, almost like you're closing a car door with your backside. You can place your hands on your thighs as you hinge to feel the movement and to help to support your back. One of my favorite bone safe tools is the golfer's pickup, which is perfect for picking something small up off of the floor without rounding your spine. If you work with a physical therapist after having a compression fracture, you'll likely learn this technique along with the hip hinge. There are a couple of different versions of the golfer's pickup. The first of these is to hold onto a nearby surface like a chair or a countertop for support. From here, shift your weight onto one leg. Let the opposite leg extend straight back behind you like a counterbalance while your torso leans forward in a straight line. Keep your spine neutral the whole time. This keeps the movement happening at your hips and not in your back. It's a simple strategy with a big impact on fracture prevention. The second version can be used if there isn't something nearby to hold onto while you're using this technique. Step one leg forward and with your opposite arm, bring your torso into a small slight twist to keep your back safe from coming into a rounded shape while you lean forward. You can leave your back leg on the floor or let it lift slightly off the floor. Both of these variations keep your spine neutral the whole time. This keeps the movement happening at your hips and not in your back. It's a simple strategy with a big impact on fracture prevention. When you stack these small changes together, having a neutral spine, hip hinging, and using the golfer's pickup, you'll find that you're building new habits that protect your bones, reduce pain, and give you confidence to move safely again. The truth is after a compression fracture, movement is medicine, as long as it's the right kind of movement. And that's where a lot of people get stuck. They either avoid movement altogether out of a fear, or they go back to their normal routines too soon and they risk having another fracture. This brings us to the third thing that you must do after having a compression fracture, and that's to strengthen the extensor muscles of your spine. A 2008 study published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings looked at patients who had undergone vertebroplasty, which is a procedure that's used to stabilize fractured vertebrae by inserting a bit of cement into the spine. The researchers wanted to know, would engaging in back extensor exercises make a difference in long-term outcomes? What they found was striking. Patients who did back extensor strengthening exercises had significantly fewer new fractures compared to those who didn't exercise. In other words, strengthening the muscles along the back of the spine helped to protect these patients from future injuries. There are times when a compression fracture is severe enough that medical intervention such as vertebroplasty is absolutely necessary. Please keep that in mind as I go over the following statistics. The researchers for this study found that the average refracture rate for a compression fracture was about five months after the first compression fracture for patients who had just had vertebroplasty. For patients who had vertebroplasty and worked to strengthen the extensor muscles of their spine, the refracture rate was actually pushed out to about two and a half years, which is a major thing. But for the patients who didn't have vertebroplasty and instead they just opted to consistently do exercises that targeted strengthening the extensor muscles of their spine, the average refracture rate was pushed out to an average of five years after the first compression fracture, which is really significant. This study is an important reminder that while procedures like vertebroplasty can treat an existing fracture, they don't fix the underlying cause, but strengthening the spinal muscles is something that you can do to help to reduce your future risk naturally, safely, and effectively now and for the long term. 
In my opinion, everyone who's had a compression fracture should do exercises to strengthen the extensor muscles of the spine. And really everyone who has bone loss should be focused on strengthening these muscles too. A compression fracture can feel like a setback, but it can also be an opportunity, a wake up call, a moment to hit pause, to reevaluate how you move and to take proactive steps to protect your bones for years to come. Getting the right diagnosis, managing pain safely, moving mindfully, and strengthening the muscles that hold you upright are not just recovery steps, they're your pathway forward. When you care for your spine with intention, you reduce pain, you regain confidence, and you restore your quality of life, you don't have to live in fear of the next fracture. If you found this video helpful, please share it with someone who may need this information and will find it helpful. And if you want more guidance on bone safe movement, nutrition, and building stronger bones naturally, check out the links in the description below. And there's also a link to this study that I mentioned in this video. Thank you for being here and for joining me in the journey to better bone health. I look forward to talking with you soon.